Yeah, good to see you all here. I can see some 8.30 faces. <laughs> I, I wish they would just abandon daylight saving time. I wish they just, you know, if you live in Saskatchewan, they never change the clock. It's just the same all year long, you know, but we've got the mountains. So apparently if you have mountains, then you have to change the clock because it, <laughs> Lord bless the governments in the world in Jesus' name. Um, I want to dig into something interesting this morning. We were just at a, a, a conference in Medicine Hat, uh, Alberta Link. Um, I think some of you were here for the Alberta Link that we had here. How many of you remember that? There was an Alberta Link. We had people come from all over the province. Uh, but it's primarily set up with leaders, um, pastors and leaders, business leaders, um, etc. cetera. And uh, last weekend or this week actually, was actually the fourth anniversary of our first one. When we had the first one, it was a calling together of the ecclesia. Ecclesia is, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That word there was ecclesia. I will build the ecclesia. And literally the ecclesia means those, in meaning his body, whom I have anointed and commissioned to change the world. And so uh, one of the things that, that we, we started to do four years ago, because of the experience that we'd had before with David Damien and the Watchman organization, David would call uh, groups of, of whoever wanted to come, pastors and leaders and so forth, to come, and we would go to places and pray. We went to Charlottetown, and we prayed uh, there and had meetings there. We had meetings in Quebec, and there was reconciliation between the French and the English. We had meetings in different parts of the nation, and there was reconciliation between the First Nations and uh, the, the settlers and the whites and, and what had come. And what was amazing was watching God do healing in the nation. Like, we would do uh, one of these weekends, and the next week, the prime minister would get up and announce uh, a new enactment of, um, like one thing was, he actually got up at that time, it was um, Stephen Harper, and he said, we, we want to acknowledge the rejection of the Jewish ship that came over during the, uh, the Second World War, and the government at that time said, we're not receiving that ship, they were trying to escape from the... Uh, the Nazi occupation, they were sent back and, uh, what was it, 70% of them died in the concentration camps because Canada didn't want to dirty its hand with the Jews because it was too controversial. It was totally a political decision. And when you do something like that, the Bible says, who, who blesses you is blessed, he who curses you is cursed. They're still the children of Abraham. And when, when we did the reconciliation spiritually, it was interesting and, and significant to watch then the government not knowing what we had done, something that God reaches down and touches and the actual physical government says, we want to, do, uh, we want to, re to repent for that and we want to restore that relationship. And they officially repented to Israel. And, to the nation. and we saw a number of things like that happen. I won't, I won't go into all the details. So when that stopped several years ago, um, there was one individual that felt like that was supposed to start, that, it, that in Alberta, we wanted that again. We wanted to bring the ecclesia together. And he called about probably 12 of us pastors who'd been involved in those things before, and he said, we're feeling like there's something in Alberta that we can do this in Alberta and watch things in Alberta shift on a governmental level. That we can do things and see God begin to bless Alberta again. Some of you have been around long enough that you remember the Heritage Trust Fund that back in the day when Lockheed was here, we had hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars because there was wisdom in our government about spending and saving and investing and all those sorts of things. And Alberta was known as the golden province. Um, and of course, over the years, we've seen some uh, bad governmentalism and, 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 and those kinds of things being eroded and, and the blessing that God put here uh, being just frittered away when, when, when we are, we used to be, and maybe one day we'll be again, but Alberta was the buckle of the Bible belt in um, this nation. And uh, yeah, I'm trying not to go too much detail on that. So... One of the things that was interesting that this week when we met as a small group, the premier came to meet with us. And she came to meet with us for about, there was about 20, 25 of us there, Paul, hey, somewhere in there. Um, and she came to meet with us and she just shared a little bit of her heart. It was in Medicine Hat. That's where the meetings were. Coincidentally, 
Um, that's where her writing is. And coincidentally, she was actually there. And coincidentally, the only time that she could meet with us was when our small leadership group arrived um, right after the lunch. And, uh, you know, you look at things like that and you just think, okay, something's going on here. And again, I won't go into all the details, but she shared for about 15 or 20 minutes. And she talked about, um, the, the Alberta pension plan. She talked uh, a little bit about dealing with the federal government. And of course, she talked about her recent decision to speak up on behalf of the vulnerability of our children and our youth, um, for which we, we thanked her for that. And um, she, you know, there just was a lot of support there, and she knew that the people that were there represented churches and ministries and businesses, probably representing hundreds or, or thousands of people. Uh, and then we had a short chance to ask questions. There were three or four questions that were asked, and then she took a few minutes just to shake hands and, and to, you know, say hi to everybody. And uh, one of the neat things that I've noticed about our premier is that um, she's thorough. She's researched, she's well researched. When she was asked questions, she answered knowledgeably on the subjects that she was asked with a depth of understanding about what that actually meant. And uh, you know, I'm so glad for a premier that's number one, she's got common sense. Number two, she's got the courage to stand up for, and I, I was able to say this to her, I asked her a question, but I said, thank you for standing up for something that years ago, meaning the, the gender thing, that was years ago seemed to be um, <clears throat> common sense, but now is greatly reflected by our moral worldview as, as Christians, like, because really it's coming down to us as the people of God to stand for, you know, a boy's a boy and a girl's a girl and never the twain shall meet unless they get married. <laughs> I just thought of that right at the end there. That was just, uh... <laughs> um, and so anyways, we went, we went from that into the meeting. And, and basically what we've done in these meetings, we all as ministers come full, but we have no agenda. There's nobody set to preach. There's no set time. There's no announcements. We do one offering over the course of the weekend. But the purpose is to come and to seek God. And I want to show you something today. I want to go somewhere with you that I believe will, will help you to understand a little bit about this church if you're new in this church. But more than that, it will help you to understand a little bit of, of what the body is moving into. And it was interesting because what, what happened with the worship here this morning and the new songs and stuff didn't happen in the first service. It didn't, it, it, it just, it didn't happen at all. And um, John was going up and John's not a singer. John's like, if it's going to be singing, I'm not the guy to do it. And, but he got up and sensing something in the spirit, tell, told Ben to keep going. I don't know if you noticed. And then he just stepped off over there to the side to let whatever it was happen. And so I'm down here listening, thinking, all right, I am a singer, but are we supposed to do something? Or are we supposed to move on? And I just thought, no, there's a couple of more little thresholds here. And you want to open, you want to open something that exposes something. And, um, and there, I'll, I'll explain that here in a few minutes as I go into what I'm sharing about this morning. But we would go into these services and 80%, the services were two to two and a half hours. 80% of the services are worship. 80% of the services were worship. And so we would worship and then as we're worshiping, something, there would be something that would start to brew and, and we would ask, you know, as the, as the, the ecclesia, as the, the five-fold ministry guys, we would ask, I'm starting to feel this. What are you feeling? Are you, you know, is this, I feel like we need to maybe pray for this or should we intercede or, or should we call the group into repentance? Because what we're doing is we're lifting up Alberta as a province and as, as God's governmental leaders in that sense. And it's, you know, there's nothing, it's not like, oh, look at us, we're wonderful. It's just people that will gather together who are the fathers in the province and, and spiritual fathers that, that gather together and say, God, what do you want us to do? Within the measure of rule you've given us, what do you want us to do? And then we would move into something else out of the worship. But the worship went on literally 99% of the time in the background, the worship would go on because it creates an atmosphere. Years ago, let me back up and start with something. Years ago, when I first came to the Lord, I remember reading scriptures like Psalm 150, 
Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then in Revelation, there's a command to praise and bless him. And every time you turn around, the elders are falling on their faces and throwing their crowns. And there's this, and, and I remember as a, as a new Christian thinking, why does God need people to praise him all the time? And I was coming from a, a, you know, a, a foolish, soulish, fleshly perspective, but my thinking was, you know, when, when, whenever you're with somebody and they always need you to tell them how good they are, you know, or how nice they are, or how good looking they are, or, or anything, you know, man, that's a great set of clothes. And, you know, you ever notice sometimes people will draw attention to themselves because they, there's something they need, you know? Hey, how do you like my new shirt, you know? Or, or uh, hey, look at my new car, you know? <clears throat> drive up and park their car right in front of everybody, their new shiny car, you know. Well, I mean, that's okay if you got a nice car, but, you know, there's old ladies trying to get around your car, dude. There's something wrong here. <laughs> well, when you run into people that, that have to do something to draw attention to themselves, you know, I need you to praise me, it immediately tells you there's some serious insecurities on the inside because if they got to hear everybody else doing it all the time, then something in here is not happy with self. So I come into the church, I come into Christianity, and I'm like, you know, maybe God's got some issues. Because everything's about, you know, pray. there's a command. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. He wrote that. So, so I'm, you know, I'm, I remember as a new believer, I'm, I'm thinking, well, okay, I don't really get it, but, you know, whatever. <clears throat> Then I realized, of course, well, he's God, he's perfect, he's holy, he's righteous, and he can't do anything wrong. So I didn't understand it, but I just put it away and left it there. I just thought, you know what, whatever, you know. And over the years, he, he kind of snookered me because I've been a musician ever since I was a kid. My mom made me take piano when I was in grade one. Did anybody else, were you forced to take a, an instrument? Come on, put your hand up. How many of you, you were made to take? How many of you still play it? <laughs> yeah. Like four people out of the 36 that just put up their hands. I remember I was so mad. I had to go home after school in grade one. All my friends got to go and play after school. I had to go home and practice. And by the time I got to G, I was like, nah, 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 nah. so we were a musical family, both my brothers and sisters. I, I heard, I grew up hearing my two older brothers and my sister playing uh, Chopin and Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and learning all those things and <clears throat> little realizing, you know, I was... I was probably ADD, but they hadn't invented it yet, so it was hard for me to sit at the piano and, and just do, you know, scales and chords and triads because it was so boring. If they would have given me a synthesizer back then where I could add my own sounds, you know, and then they come out with those, those little keyboards where you press the button, it goes, do do chi chi do do chi do do chi chi do do chi All the musicians are like, he knows. But those of you that aren't musicians, you're like, they, they, they what? They did what? But for those of us that walk through the process, <laughs> what I didn't know was that there was a musician on the inside of me. So when I became a teenager, I bought a set of drums. Well, I didn't. My dad bought them for me. And I used to set up my drums. And back in those days, you didn't just have a snare and a tom and a floor tom and a couple of cymbals. I mean, I don't know. Some of you might have been old rockers. But if you look at some of the drum sets, it was like, and two floor toms. So everywhere that you could hit, there was something to hit. That was a, and, and I mean, when you were rocking out, so I had my drum set up, man, and I had drums, and we had speakers about the size of those bass bins. Some of you remember those back in the day? Remember when speakers were big, and you had to have two strong men with small hearts bringing them over and putting them into your... <laughs> And I, I, so I would set up the speakers on either side of my drums and then I would put the headphones on so I could hear the high notes and turn everything up to about eight. And the only time I could do it was when there was nobody else in the house. 
Because the whole house was going womp, 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 womp. <laughs> kind of like when you pull up to one of those kids, you know, with a base bin that's as big as the back of his car. And his whole car's going like this. And you roll your window up because you're old now. <laughs> so God got me back into music by, by playing the drums. And I wasn't listening to Christian music when I was 17 and 18 years of age. Well, then I came back to the Lord at 19 years of age. And at 19 years of age, um, I'd, I went home and threw away all my albums. Now, the sacrifice of, of, of getting rid of all, because it was hundreds of dollars. If I'd have kept them now, they'd be classics. I could sell them on Kijiji. Why didn't I think? <laughs> but I got rid of all those because a guy said this to me. When I was first coming back to the Lord, I just got spirit-filled. He said, the, the day will come you won't listen to anything but Christian music. And I said, no. I said, I listen to all genres of music because you can get something out of every one of them. He said, you just wait. And within a few years, I was listening only to Christian music because I found that if I listened to music that wasn't Christian, it only got to my soul. It never got to my spirit. It never got down to, to, to where I could feel it ministering you know, to my, to my spirit man that I was being drawn closer to God. And I, I realize I'm, I'm brushing the cat the wrong way. So for the, some of you that are still listening to heathen music, just turn the cat around. And, you know, <laughs> my own family, I'll go to one of my family gatherings and they've got jazz on, you know. And I thought, well, jazz is okay. You know, just get off of that, Craig, and keep moving. Just get off of that and, and, and keep going. So... The first church that we were in was a little church of about 70 people, and um, all they had, they just started the church, and all they had was a guitar player. Well, my wife's got a bachelor's of music and, and taught piano for years. She, got, she went into conservatory music 10 years and then went into university and got her degree. Uh, well, so we thought, well, we can help them out. So she becomes the piano player, and I become the drummer. And as we were, as we were playing for the first time, I started to feel something different than what I used to feel when I was just rocking out, you know, with the Rolling Stones or with, with uh, Star Castle or with uh, any of these groups. And I, and I started to feel, and notes would come to me, like, like when to play the note and rhythms would come and things like that. And I was like, what is going on? What, I, I know things, you know, at first you just think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm some kind of hot drummer. And then you realize that it was the anointing that, that God actually, and I didn't know anything about church music. I didn't, you know, this was brand new, little teeny church. We didn't know anything about, the, the most rocked out music you could get back then was things like, seek ye first the kingdom of God. How many of you remember that? And his, oh, you guys are old, man. And I remember playing my drums and, and, you know, when you're a new drummer and you always want to put something in, so it'd be like, do, do, chick, do, 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 chick, do, 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 chick, do, do, and his righteousness. And all these things will be. And I remember the pianist uh, or the uh, guitar player looking over at me, kind of like, but you're a young drummer and it just, it works right there and, and I love this, you know. And what I realized was that there was an anointing to play. And so I started to get drawn into the music and I got drawn into the experience of feeling his presence in music and I, I left behind my bias on why do we have to praise God all the time? It was still there, sort of over there, but I loved what I was feeling, but I didn't understand why God just, you know, why, why, do, you, why do we have to praise you all the time? Like, what is your issue? Are you, you know, are you insecure? <clears throat> so I liked the way that it felt when I did it, but a few years ago, probably 10 years ago, the Lord brought this back because he was trying to teach me on some of the deeper things of, of music and worship, on why we praise and worship. What is it with praise and worship? And having been a worshiper now for so many years, he could bring me from the experience of it to what the scriptures actually meant. And I wanna, I wanna share a little bit of this with you today, and then we're gonna, we're gonna go into it in a little bit more detail. 
Why, why do we do worship the way that we did it, the way that we do it? Why is it that our worshipers, you know, Ben will be leading or, or Samara or um, Sherry, and they'll go into spontaneous words. They'll go into something different. One of the things that, that, that we did this weekend that was brand new, the church that we were in was an Evangelical Missionary Alliance church. For those of you familiar with their very, very scriptural, very structured but the pastor there is fired up. And I mean, he's hungry. And I, I was able to have lunch with him. We talked for an hour and a half straight. And I just, the spirit on that man is so sweet. I'm going to tell you, tell you this. I could prophesy it, but I'm, I will prophesy it. That the spirit that's moving amongst the churches of those that are hungry, even amongst those who aren't full gospel, will soon usurp the blessing that the Pentecostal and full gospel churches had, but they have relinquished because they have relinquished the daring of moving by my spirit into those things which are deeper and better because they don't want to offend those who don't understand. I'm telling you, that's what's happening. I saw that. I saw that this weekend. And here's this man who's moving in and I got an hour and a half lunch and we just talked boom 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 we just talked about things because there were things that were happening in the services there that were brand new for him and you know us being involved in this kind of stuff for years and I saw something I thought God's going to bypass a bunch of us who think we've got it for the people who are hungry no matter what name they have written over their door glory to God he's going to do it for the sake of the body and not for the sake of any denomination hallelujah So the Lord began to shift things in my, and here's one of the first questions that he asked me, or I won't say he asked me, but this came up because he's always telling us to praise him. Well, a humble person wouldn't do that in the natural, right? So the question comes up, and this is the question I had to answer, is God humble? And you think, well, yeah, because he's God, like it's part of his nature, but where's that in scripture? How do you find out? So I had to, I always go to the Bible, right? I just, okay, God, where is it in the Bible? I'll just have something, I'll have a voice speak to me in the spirit, I'll go, where's that in the Bible? If it's God, he'll go, oh, well, there's that one. And I remember one time I said, you know, Lord, I know the Bible pretty good, and uh, I don't know where that is. And he said, you don't know it as good as you think you know it. <laughs> and I was like, yep, that's you. <laughs> so if God is humble, second question, is God humble? If God is humble, why does he require us to praise him? So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Go to Matthew 11 and Psalm 113. Matthew 11 and Psalm 113. And I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I want to get to a couple of things this morning. Um, that I actually have never shared before anywhere in church. Why does God require us to praise him? Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Notice the next line. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. The word lowly is the same word as humble, same root as humble. I am lowly. What does that mean? I'm, 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 I'm down. I'm not putting myself up. I'm, I'm down. I'm, I'm lowly. I'm humble. And you will find rest for your souls. Okay. Psalm 113 and verse six says that God humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. So God humbles himself. Think of it. He created everything. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need angels. He doesn't need cherubim or seraphim. He is the eternally omnipotent, omniscient, e existent one who fills all in all. He is all and in all. He is all things. There's nothing that's not. He is all things. Which is a, a, a little bit of a contradiction to what I said to you guys many, uh, two or three months ago when I was talking about love. And I said that love has a weakness. Therefore, God has a weakness. 
And what I said was that love always needs somebody to express itself on. Without someone else to express itself on, it's not full. It's not walking in fullness. And I caught some flack for that. This lady walked out and got all mad because God has a weakness. Well, she didn't stay long enough to find out there's another side to that, that God, God has no weaknesses at all. He's totally, completely all in. He's, he's it, right? But he humbles himself to behold what he created, you and me, the glory of the stars. I don't know how many of you saw the sunset this morning. Wait, it's the 11 o'clock crew. For those of you that did not see the sunset this morning, it was gorgeous. And there was, you know, the way the clouds were in the orange and all the spectrums. And I started to laugh on the way here. And I'm looking east and I said, there you go. I said, just showing off again. I said, nobody can do it like you do it. And I laughed and laughed and laughed because that's just, it's, that's how he and I are, you know. I think he just does it for me. He just, it's like, yeah. So he humbles himself. Now, one more thing, and, and I'll just read this one. But 1 Corinthians 13 from the Amplified defines the nature of love, right? It says, love endures long, is patient, kind, never is envious, doesn't boil over with jealousy. Well, you can take that and turn it around and say God endures long and is patient because God is love, John said, right? In John's first epistle. So I, I, I use that as a self-description of God's nature. God, and here's what it says in the Amplified. God is not boastful or vainglorious. Vainglorious means I need you to notice what I do. Vain, glorious, I need this, I need you to... So it says God's not vainglorious. He does not display himself haughtily. He's not conceited or arrogant or inflated with pride. Here's a good one. This messed me up. So I'm like, why does God insist on being praised? He does not insist upon his own rights or his own way. And I'm like, wait a minute, you insist upon us praising you. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, right? So he's processing me out of my, my soulish understanding into something that's deeper that he wants me to get because he wants me to understand that when we do what we did this morning, there's things that are initiated in the spirit behind that that bring spiritual shifts, not only in us as a church, but in our hearts and in our city yes. when we'll learn to do that. The Bible says Judah is my lawgiver. Judah is praise. The sound of Judah brings law in the spirit. It displaces enemy spirits and it establishes the sounds of God. Oh, I wish I'd go into that, but I'll come back to that. Okay, so God's not boastful or vainglorious. He's not haughty, conceited, arrogant, or proud. And he doesn't insist upon his own rights or his own way. And he's not self-seeking. So when we praise him, it has nothing to do with him in his mind. <laughs> Some of you are like, gishner, 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 gishner. <laughs> Think about what I just said. If he, he doesn't need our praise. He created something that would enable us to connect with him. We've established that he's humble So why all the praise and worship? Because to worship him, to praise him, and to express ourselves requires us to humble ourselves. So if he's already lowly, he said, you have to come to where I am to meet me and I'm going to require you to do something that goes directly against your own pride and your own self-image and what you feel other people think about you. I'm going to require you to come into my presence and lift up your hands, which is yada, one of the Hebrew seven words for praise, to thrust forth the hands. I'm going to require you to do that. Why are you requiring this of me? How many of you remember the first time you raised your hands in church? You remember that? It took me 15 minutes. Because I'm there worshiping. I'll give you my process because it'll help some of you. I'm there worshiping. Think about, think about the point that I'm making here. To, to connect with him, we have to humble ourselves because he's lowly. Which is totally contradictory to the fact that he's this massive, omnipotent, amazing God that spoke and created everything. 
So rather than having us connect up there, he goes, they're going to get proud and when they fall, they're going to get selfish and they're going to get self-focused and they're going to have sin and all of that. So I've got to create a way of them connecting with me that undoes all of that or goes lower and it's going to require something they don't want to give. And that's obedience and willingness. So I'm in a church and it was a charismatic church that I went to with my mom because she wanted me to go. <laughs> I had just come back to the Lord, never lifted my hands, and I'm standing in that church, and just, you know, I'm young, I'm cool, I got hair down to the middle of my back, I got jeans with holes in the knees back when you, you couldn't buy them that way. <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing there like this, and I'm just worshiping Jesus, and on the inside, I get this, this picture, this sense of, of doing this. And, and immediately, because if your soul is the gatekeeper for your spirit, then the soul will restrict the freedom of the spirit's expression. And I'm like, and on the inside, I pushed it down. I'm not doing that. And here, here you know, the devil's sweet lies. I don't need to do that, to, that God knows that I love him, to show God I love him. And then as soon as I got rid of that and, and pushed in again and just enjoyed the music and, and uh, you know, this is when I first came back to the Lord before we went to the church where I was playing the drums. And, and this picture comes again, just this little unction, just a, and I'm, I'm like, no, because I'm cool and I'm young. And what will people think? Like the guys behind me, they'll think, well, that guy's really finally getting it, you know? I mean, thank God. Thank God he's getting touched. Which to the, my, my man's mind was a show of weakness. I pushed it away. And I'm just worshiping again. And this thing comes up the third time. And I'm like, for Pete's sake. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, maybe it's God. It's like one guy said, you know, how can you be so dumb and still breathe? <laughs> so I went like this. Because I didn't want anybody else to see, right? I'm just one. And then you're thinking, like, this is kind of dumb, right? If somebody looks over, it's like, what this? You, I'm, you know, I'm receiving an offering or what? I'm just got, got my hand out. I was just, I was just like... And then my mind goes, well, you look even dumber now than you did before. And so then I went like, I did, the, it took me over 10 minutes to do this. And finally, because I'm going through this process, and I went like this. And I'm here like this, and you know, and I'm just, and I'm like, okay, I am stepping out. Like I am, I mean, the angels are going to sing now, because look what I did for Jesus, you know. And I'm doing this, and the Lord is so sweet. All that comes is that little picture, that little sense of, of doing this. And I'm like, <sighs> so then I went like this. <laughs> this, I, this is what I did. So for those of you that are hard nosed, I'm helping you out right now. See, it's still safe because my hand is here, but you can't see my hand if you're standing behind me. So, so I'm still worshiping, but nobody, you know, nobody behind me knows this guy's breaking down up here. But now I think of it, and I got one hand like this and one hand like this. And it's kind of like, well, what are you going to do now? You know, are you gonna, are you gonna... And, and I thought, it's, it, the Holy Ghost will dig you in and he'll throw you down into the, you know. And I thought, oh, man. And I thought, well, at least they should look the same. Now I'm like this. Talk about your pride, you know? And then I'm, I, I think to myself, so, so what, what's this? You, you know, you're doing push-ups on the, I mean, what are you? Because the Lord will lead you through and he'll laugh all the way through with you. He'll laugh at the foolish things you're doing. And finally I'm like this, you know? And then I'm like, and I'm thinking, okay, I am really stepping out here. Like I'm, <laughs> and, and the devil says to your mind everybody's watching you now because this is a universal sign of surrender right 
And your mind, and my mind was just going, oh, you look great now. Well, it wasn't my mind, it was the devil. Oh, you look like such a fool. You're supposed to be having it. You're supposed to be there and you're on it and you're young and you're cool and all this. And here you are with your hands up looking like, oh, I've got all these problems. And that's what you think is, oh, I'm, I'm so weak and I'm so, you know, that people would think about you. And so I'm thinking, okay, like, angels are about to come into the room. Like, I'm gonna hear the, oh, from, and, and I'm like this. And now I'm stuck because I can't go back into worship because I'm thinking about my arms. And I just pushed, I just pushed. I just was like, whatever, whatever. And you know what I, what I, I saw, and it wasn't a vision, I was expecting it, but as I pushed back into worship, just to worship, because now you're in, right? Now, now you're one of them. <laughs> and as I did that, all I got was this little picture of the father sort of looking over the banister of heaven going like this. <laughs> he was just smiling that I did it. Now, I told that story for those of you who've never lifted your hands. Because the thing that stops you and I from responding in the spirit of praise or the spirit of worship is the self-focus that won't let us express because something in the soul says you can't do that or dot, 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 and you fill it in. I didn't know back then that yada was one of the seven Hebrew words for praise. I didn't know that Paul said uh, to Timothy by the Holy Ghost, that men everywhere would lift up their holy hands without wrath and doubting. I didn't know that it was in the Bible. I didn't know about it. But my spirit, when I got in that service, my spirit felt I need to express this to God. Now listen to me. When you yield to whatever the particular anointing is that's there, like we shout as a church. One of the Hebrew words for praise is to shout. Another one of this is to shout with ear-piercing cries. It's actually one of the Hebrew words. How many churches shout with ear-piercing cries? Why? Well, we don't do that because it's not a part of our Western culture, which means that the culture of the world has now usurped the culture of heaven that wants to manifest in the church, and we don't do that because that's not part of our culture. And the moment you didn't give place to that, you shut that anointing down from being able to come into the church and bring the freedom that that anointing brings, which is what they feel in heaven when they're doing it. We restrict ourselves by the fear of not doing it right, or what will other people think? And until that anointing, until you yield, you you guys have heard me say this, spiritual things do not become a part of us until we do them. You can have a head this full of the scripture. I've heard guys with doctorates get up and talk about the nature of God, and I thought, this guy is dumber than a goose in a blizzard. He has no clue. (laughs) Here he is talking about the nature of God, and he doesn't know God. He doesn't even know. He's like, well, I wasn't, we're not, you know, the Bible's not clear if God actually has a physical form. And I start rattling off these things about God and the hand of God, the arm of God, and, you know, these, the, under the footstool of God. So what, he's just a, this little cloud and a foot comes out and there's a stool? I mean, give your head a shake. And you can be super intelligent and you can be a spiritual dunce. You can have three doctorates and not have a clue about spiritual things because spiritual things don't become a part of us until we do them. And until you and I yield in worship, the spiritual freedom that's behind that act will not become a part of our experience in God. That's why when some of us get to heaven, we're gonna be in the romper room worship class because we would never allow ourselves the expression And I could go all the way down the line when the Lord started to move on me to cry. I'd be in the worship and I'd feel the tears come up and I'm pastoring the church. And the church was 100 people at that time. And on the inside, I said, I'm not crying. I said, I'm not crying. There's no way I'm not gonna cry because if I cry, the people will think, it's what comes to my mind, comes to your mind. Well, if I cry, the people will think I've sinned and now I'm feeling really bad about it on Sunday morning. That's what came to my mind. I don't know what comes to your mind, but my flaky mind, that's what came to my mind, was the devil coming up saying, oh, if you cry, what will the people think? 
Because you're the pastor. You're have to, supposed to have it all together. You're not supposed to show any weakness. It took me months to get through that. As the Holy Spirit would come and he would move on me and he would move on me and he would move on me and I'd feel that. I, I, and I knew that, that the yielding of my tears would open something, but there were so many arguments in my soul and my spirit was trying to say, open, open, yield to this, yield to this. Because my spirit was feeling something. Let me tell you something. And I, it's a, I'll get into this next week with how spiritual sounds work. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word created all things. He spoke. When he said, let there be light, was he speaking English? <laughs> he gets on me, I get on you. I was going, he was teaching me about sounds. He was teaching me about worship. And that question came up on the inside, whether it was God or just my own spirit. Said, when, when, I, when, when, when those words came out, let there be light. Was it English? I thought, well, pfft, be pretty proud to presume that's what it was. Being just how the Anglo-Saxons weren't even around for several thousand more years. Somebody said, well, it was Hebrew. Well, the Hebrews weren't around either for... Another 2,000 when Abraham came along. But then it says this in Hebrews. Who created all things by the word of his power. It didn't say that he created all things by the power of his word. He created all things by the word of his power. What if when God created all things, he released a sound Hum. And light became, because in that sound was the definition of what was in God to release. Our, our dimension goes from the speed of light down. The spiritual dimension starts at the speed of light and goes up. So our scientists have discovered molecules, then atoms, then electrons, then quarks. But the quarks are so small, they're the smallest particle that they've, they've found in, in, in the context of what I'm talking about. They're so small, you can't see the quark. All you can see is its effect on other things. It vibrates. And I read this from a physicist, an <clears throat> astrophysicist. He said, we believe that it may be that the particle... That is the crossover particle from antimatter to matter is a sound. So what the physicists, that's what our scientists are saying. So the thing that goes from the spirit world, which is what they call antimatter, to the natural matter world, which is you and I sitting here with flesh and bone and chairs and metal and steel and all of that, is a sound. And I, got, I threw my Bible up in the air. I said, that's it. That's it, that's it, that's it. That's what it means that he spoke. He spoke and he released something. It may have been a word of some kind, but he released a sound. And that sound created light. So the root of that upon which all matter is built is sound. Just follow me for a minute. That's why he said, the things that I do, the works that I do, you can do also and greater works than I'm doing. He wasn't just talking about the miraculous. He was talking about the awareness of how spiritual things shift. What did Jesus say? What did he release to create the water molecules firming up so that he could spend an hour and a half walking across the lake so that when his foot hit the water molecules, it went. 
Jesus always cast demons out by saying something. He never gave him the lazy eye. Why? Because the, the power doesn't come until it's spoken. Master, come, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and heal her. The place that he was talking about was 30 miles away from there. He couldn't go there. He was on his way. Go your way, your daughter lives. Your servant lives, pardon me. Go your way, your servant lives. He goes over there, and, the, they, and he, they meet him. The servants meet him halfway, and they said, yesterday at the such and such hour, he began to mend. That was when Jesus released a sound, the sound that went there. When you get under the anointing, you can come up to somebody and say, ba, ba, black sheep. And if you know what the anointing is and you release the anointing, the anointing will transfer. Because it's a sound. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, let me, let me, let me help you with something. Scientists have discovered that everything in our universe vibrates at a certain frequency. They now plot the size and density of planets and galaxies by astro-seismology because they can determine the sound that's coming from that planet. Earth's sound is 7.5 hertz. The sound of Earth. Some of you that are piano players know this better than I do, but our, our spectrum only goes to so many hertz from, from low to, but there are planets that vibrate hundreds of octaves lower than our spectrum of sound. Dogs can hear way more sounds than we can hear because their, their ears are attuned that way. But here's what's interesting. Those sounds, they map the universe's sounds and the sounds of every different star. And the Bible says that the morning stars sang together for joy. Two meanings. Number one, it could be the stars being the angels. But think about this. If every planet, every every astronomical body is vibrating with sound. What God is hearing is a symphony of a billion, billion planets, pulsars, great uh, white dwarfs, universes, systems. They now say there's, it's a multiverse. It's not just one universe. There are universes built on other universes. Imagine the orchestral sound that the father is hearing because creation is singing back to him. Let me show you this. Go to Psalm 148. Are you still here? I'm saving the good stuff for next week. Psalm 48. I thought for years this was metaphorical. I thought it can't be, it can't, it can't. That's nice, you know, that it reads that way. Psalm 48, praise the Lord. Praise him in the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Right up until there, everything's wonderful. But then it says, praise him sun and moon. And I thought, well, they, that, you know, obviously the sun and the moon can't praise God. So it's metaphorical, right? He's like, oh, it's so important. Even the sun and moon should praise God. But then all of a sudden you find out that everything has a resonant frequency that it, it was created by because sound is the, is the matrix of the physical creation. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens and waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. Praise him, you great sea creatures in all the depths. Well, you're thinking, yeah, that's okay. That's kind of like, but actually they're the great sea creatures are going to praise the Lord. But then it goes into look at verse 8. Praise him, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. This is all, this is a command for them all to praise him. Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl. And he goes on and talks about that. 
And all of a sudden, when you understand that everything that God made is vibrating or resonating at a particular frequency, he just created a symphony in the universe that everything praises him. I had, a, I had a, a, a thing, I tried to find it between services. I had a thing on my phone, which um, was crickets. And the crickets were slowed down to the same resonance as what we would sing with. And it sounded like angels. Like we hear this, you know, that's a frog. What's it called? <laughs> How they do that. And they slowed it down and it was like, And you're listening to this and you think you're hearing the best soprano sing. And I'm like, seriously? All they had to do was slow it down a little bit to where you and I would hear what actually it would sound like if they were our size, which could be mildly dangerous. (laughs) So now we begin to see that the psalm is literal. Everything in creation is resonating to sing at the frequency that God made it to. I gotta finish with this. Your cellular molecular makeup is absolutely unique. We, each one of us, and we've heard that before. But now think about this. You and I resonate back to God because we're alive but you're not a rock. So you're not stuck with like, you know, A minor. You're not, you're not, because he put his spirit in us, we can let that spirit create through us melodies and harmonies and chords and words and we, we create, you know, remember that old song, Lord make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. We had no idea what we were singing. But here's what, I'm, here's what I want you to get today. All of it. I want you to get this part right here. The sound that he created for you stays in the spirit as part of your, your, your birthright, your destiny. It stays there until you begin to allow that sound to come out because it has to come from the spirit world into the natural world. And your sound will never come into the natural world until you release it through yourself. When you do, it actually manifests in the physical. And James said this, that the tongue is a world of fire, a source of great iniquity, and it changes the sphere of existence around you. Well, if that's true, then the very same things can happen that it can be a a source of great blessing and instead of bringing fire and bringing destruction, it brings, and we literally create a sphere around us of heavenly release. So when, when, when you, when you think, well, you know, it's nice and I'm I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sing because, you know, my voice isn't that nice and. Do you know why our band is so loud? It's so you can sing. <laughs> and if you sing really bad, you know, we'll say, look, go up and sing in the corner, but belt it out. <laughs> like, go up and sing and just, and why? Because we want people to be able to make a joyful noise. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Until you let that sound out, the manifestation of the anointing of what heaven has in that sound does not begin to happen in your life. That's why people that have never lifted their hands find it difficult to lift their hands. That's why people who've never shouted come into a church and the first time they're here and we shout, they're kind of like, but then you know what happens when you shout? When you shout... Something right here goes, and the next time you shout, it goes, and the next time you shout, it goes, and finally it goes, and when you do that, Jericho's walls in your life, boom, they drop, 
and you go back into your work week. You go back into your work week and all of a sudden your boss gives you a raise. You go back into your work week and the car that you had died and the insurance company goes, oh, that was a special car and you're going to get this much for it because you released something from the sound of heaven that now went out into the natural. Stand up, stand up. That's why we praise like we praise. This pastor said something interesting to me. We were sitting there and, and when you do three hours of worship, you get high points and then you get dead points because everything in the spirit comes in waves. Everything in the natural comes in waves. All sound is waves, right? High frequencies, low frequencies, all of it's waves. All of this is science and physics. It's all waves. And uh, he asked me about something, and I, I said to him, um, I said, most people, when we've gone through and, and hit a wave, you know, I didn't say the wave, but I said, it really gets up, and I said, then it comes down to a, a quiet spot or a spot where it's, the worship team's kind of waiting, looking, what are we supposed to do, which way are we supposed to go? And I said, that's the place that most people check out because they're not feeling what I just felt. Like, man, it was rocking a few minutes ago, so maybe we're done here. Well, maybe we are done. But in a meeting like that, what happens is that's where the worship team is. Everybody's listening, and we've learned to do this. I learned to do this, doing it, traveling all over the world. We get to that quiet place, and I'd start listening. Okay, what? we're at the place where there's a new wave. What's the new wave sound like? Is it a praise wave? Is it a worship wave? Is it a repentance wave? Is it a humbling myself wave? Is it an altar call wave? What is it? What's coming? What, what's there? And, and people will automatically, because they're not feeling the juice anymore, they'll automatically go, mm, and come back up into their soul and expect because the soul wants to be entertained. It wants to have something that's, and that's where the spirit man begins to tell the soul, listen, be quiet. How many times, you guys, did I say to you this morning, close your eyes, focus on Jesus, Close your eyes. Because for some of you, and that's why we put up that slide that says open worship. Because people come into the church and we're not singing a song. And, and Ben's going, oh, 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 oh. And people are like, where's the worship in this? Sometimes it's the sound that's coming forth and not the words. Sometimes it's the sound, and as they're singing that, they're, they're waiting, they're listening on the inside. Why? Because we want to hit the next gear. Your ability to get in and go, it, it, it's like going in, Lord, where is it? I know. I can smell, I can smell the donuts. I can smell, I can smell, and, and you'll, be, you'll be there, and you'll get a little whiff as a worship leader. You'll get a little whiff of, oh, oh. Was that a rhythm? Was that a word? Was that a sound? Because heaven always works that way. And if you, if you listen for that, and that's what we train these guys to do, to listen for that. And as a congregation, you guys are great, because you're so patient to let them experiment. How many times this morning did we just go into stuff, you know, you started off with something, oh, how we love you, 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 oh, how we love you. What we're hoping that happens is about five minutes in, you go, oh, I love you. And then you move into that, and all of a sudden, and you start to feel he gushes on you, and you're like, and I love you too, and you're moving in. <laughs> because you, you aligned with the frequency that heaven was releasing. So what do you got, man? <laughs> Let's just do that for a minute, whatever that is, before we go. Get your mind quiet.
Can you grab it with your heart? Do you feel the sweetness? It's just real sweet right now. Just feel that real sweet, gentle spirit. Wait for you to come and show your glory today. Just take a couple of minutes, church. For you to come and show your glory today. Do it again. We wait for you to come and show your glory here today. We wait for you to come and show your glory We wait for you. We wait for you. Push past your mind. Push past your mind right now. Push past your mind. Push in. Push in. Push in. We wait. Sing, we wait for you. We wait for you. We wait for you. this would be a place where the portal of heaven is open so wide that those who come in who've never felt your presence would come and in the middle of the worship suddenly something would open that they would feel your presence that they would know surely God is in this place pray Father we pray that this may be a place where the angels come ascending and descending and I pray for every person in this place right now for those who may have been restricted because they feel like their voice is foolish for those who may have struggled 
with moving in and just worshiping you and not even caring about what anybody else thinks. If you've struggled with this, this well, everybody's just focusing on Jesus. I just want you to put your hand on your heart right now. If it, for any reason, praise and worship has been a struggle, just put your hand on your heart right now. Lord, all over this room, you see some have been hindered by the devil, some have been hindered by our, our own mind that fights us, some have been hindered by the culture, some have been hindered by our parents or by our upbringing. Oh, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that there would be such freedom in this house to worship you that the very cloud of glory would fill the room. And I speak over this church the sounds of heaven, visions and revelations. For you said in the last days that your sons and your daughters would prophesy and they would have visions and revelations. And it comes through our worship. When our worship opens the heavens, when we open our hearts, our hearts open the heavens and you respond. And I ask, Father, for a grace right now for every person in this room to be able to move to the next level as I share on this over these next couple of weeks, to walk into the deep things of your presence, that you might be glorified, that your kingdom might be manifested, and that we would know this truth, and this truth would make us free. I speak over you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you need prayer this morning, we've got some prayer. Joining us online today, we hope you enjoyed the service. If you'd like more information about Southside Victory Church, download our app from the App Store, follow us on social media, or check out our website at svcf.ca. If you'd like to hear more from Pastor Craig, you can check out www.timesofrefreshing.com or follow Times of Refreshing on social media to see if he's speaking in a city near you. You can connect with the church anytime, give us a phone call, or send us an email. Thanks again for joining us in building a community of believers together. We'll see you next week.